I would like to introduce our presenters today. Dr. Nancy Marchand Martella is a professor of special education teaching classes in academic remediation with focus on reading, writing, spelling, and mathematics interventions. She has more than 25 years of experience working with at-risk populations and also has over 150 professional publications. She is the author of a two-level vocabulary program, multiple meaning vocabulary, and an SRA McGraw-Hill level vocabulary program, I'm sorry, and SRA McGraw-Hill author of a six-level program, Lesson Connections and Core Lesson Connections, for Reading Mastery Signature Edition and a two-course Adolescent Literacy Program Read to Achieve. She is the co-author of the new digital print and project-based SRA Flex Literacy and has published seven college-level textbooks on behavior management, research methods, and instruction. Further, she has conducted over 280 professional presentations and serves on the editorial board of three peer-reviewed journals. And finally, she served or continues to serve as a reviewer and consultant for many state and district committees focused on literacy. Also, Dr. Rama Martella is a professor of special education teaching classes in behavior management and research methodology. He has over 25 years of experience working with at-risk populations and is a board-certified behavior analyst. He provides technical assistance to numerous states and districts on school-wide positive behavior support and behavior management for students with or without disabilities. He has over 140 professional publications and is also an SRA McGraw-Hill author of a six-level program, Lesson Connections and Core Lesson Connections for Reading Mastery Signature Edition and a two-course adolescent literacy program, Read to Achieve. He is the co-author of the new digital print and project-based SRA Flex Literacy as well. In addition to these achievements, he has also published seven college-level textbooks on behavior management, research methods, and instructions. Further, he has conducted over 150 professional presentations and serves on the editorial board of a three-peer-reviewed journal. And finally, for the state of Washington, Dr. Martella serves on the statewide SWPBS leadership team and is or has served on the coach staff there for several schools throughout eastern Washington. And with that, we are so pleased to have uh, the authors with us today, and I'd like to hand over the session to them. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. We're uh, very pleased to be uh, with you today. Um, this is Ron Martella, and then with me is Nancy. Yep. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. I will be uh, primarily the person who will be uh, speaking today. Uh, Nancy will jump in um, at various points in time. I did want to uh, uh, provide a, a bit of a background um, with the meshing of instruction and behavior uh, over the years, um, Nancy has done a great deal of work in the area of instruction, specifically in literacy instruction, and I've done uh, a fair amount of work in behavior management. And over the years, we've noticed that many times when we go and provide uh, in-services or workshops or work with districts or schools, that many of the things that come up are, there's a lot of things in common. So Nancy will be presenting, for example, on um, a literacy uh, issue and behavior management always crops up. Or if I'm speaking with individuals about behavior management, uh, instruction tends to always come up. Over the years, there's been a greater meshing then of, of uh, both instruction and behavior management. And that's where we are uh, today. I think that best practice today is where we don't look at the traditional system of looking at instruction separately from behavior management, but they are one and the same thing. Um, we will highlight flex literacy today um, and highlight issues that we attempted to build into flex literacy along with other authors on the program that deal not only with instruction but also with behavior management. Now, there's several behavior management concerns uh, that's been listed over the years in the uh, research literature. Um, the first, for example, student misbehavior has been and is still the main concern of educators across the country. That has been for the last 20 years, in fact. In fact, there may be no greater hurdle in public schools today than that presented by students to exhibit challenging behavior. 
when students misbehave, they learn less. Talk to people in the school districts, they obviously know this. Uh, disruptive behavior in any classroom impedes learning, and the time spent in redirecting students back to task takes away from valuable instruction time, which in turn affects student academic performance. Continuing on with concerns, students who misbehave interfere with their uh, with the learning of their peers and consume teachers' time, disrupting the classroom and school. And difficulty managing student behavior is a factor associated with teacher burnout, stress, and dissatisfaction. This is a very key area here in terms of uh, teacher burnout, especially in the area of special ed. And in fact, in a study by McKinney in 2005, they found that 50% of urban teachers leave the profession within the first five years of their career, citing behavior problems and management as factors influencing their decision to leave. So when we talk about behavior management, it's critical to add academic program programming into uh, the mix. Bernie to Horner et al., the basic message is that academic and behavioral supports must be intertwined. Combining behavior support and effective instruction may be an important theme for school reform in the United States. Also by other authors, um, integrated three-tier reading and behavior models target those students who lack the necessary academic and behavioral resources for a successful education. I want to point out uh, here the uh, Stewart et al. 2007 article. That was a study that we published in the Journal of Positive Behavior Interventions in 2007. And this is critical. This is where we started really looking at the integration of in instruction and behavior management. Um, we looked at, we did a meta-analysis in that study on schools that did uh, school-wide restructuring specifically for reading versus schools that did a school-wide behavior uh, implementation and then those schools that did a combination of the both and of both of those. And what was interesting is that there were clear differences in the effects on both reading and behavior based on what components the schools uh, use. So for example, schools that used reading only, uh, reading only uh, uh, school-wide uh, revamping of the programs, they had about a small to moderate effect size in reading performance. Interestingly, they didn't measure behavior. The schools that did behavior only had a small impact on reading and a small to moderate impact on behavior. However, what was critical here is the schools that used an integrated approach had a large effect size, is a 0.53 in fact, on reading and a moderate effect size of 0.31 on behavior. So the significance of that study, what we found was that if you want to have a much larger impact on the academic performance of your students, you want to also add a behavior component into the mix. So academic behavior then, academic, student academic success is really composed of two things, effective instructional practices and effective behavior management approaches. Let's look for a minute on, uh, with regard to effective instruction. So the lear learning sciences have shown us what effective instruction is. Effective instruction comes from having appropriate curriculum pacing, lesson pacing, and transition management. According to Slavin, students who are participating in well-structured activities that engage their interests, who are highly motivated to learn, and who are working on tasks that are challenging yet within their capabilities, rarely pose any serious management problems. Therefore, the goal for educators is to help students become successful in the classroom both academically and behaviorally. What are the big ideas for effective instruction then? things that we really need to look at in terms of our instruction, and in particular when we're designing a, an academic program. First is differentiated instruction, meaning that we're meeting the needs of each and every individual within that program. We're not having students fall through the cracks. And I'll talk about this in a little bit uh, with regard to diagnosing behavior issues with students. Second is effective behavior management. Third, clear instructions, how well your instructions are laid out for the students. And finally, appropriate feedback, positive and corrective. Now, I, don't want to, uh, I want to uh, highlight the fact, 
how important positive and corrective feedback is, the better able you're, you are to provide appropriate corrective feedback, the better your relationships will be with your students. And I'll talk again a little bit more about that in a minute. But what was interesting is in 2003, Marzano and Marzano completed a meta-analysis of more than 100 studies and found 31% fewer discipline problems and rule violations for teachers who had positive relationships with their students over the course of a year than teachers who did not have, did not have such positive relationships. So again, I, don't, I, I want to uh, highlight the point that relationship building is absolutely critical for students, and we have to take that in consideration when we're providing appropriate, adequate feedback uh, to students based on their performance. Now, how to make our interactions more positive then? First, we want to explicitly teach and encourage class-wide expectations. That's paramount. What are your expectations? And teaching those expectations explicitly and making sure that we are reinforcing students for following those expectations. Second, explicitly teach classroom routines. Third, aim for a ratio of 5 to 1 positive to negative adult-student interactions. So what we're looking for there is trying to find five positive things to acknowledge for students to every one negative thing that the student does. Now, the data over the years have shown that it's really the reverse of that in many classrooms, where we have more negative uh, interactions versus positive interactions. So a key to effective behavior management and relationship building is to change that around to where we have a larger ratio of positive compared to negative adult-student interactions. Third, next, fourth, we want to engage in active supervision. And this ties into that 5 to 1 positive to negative interactions. Engage in active supervision isn't only where we're looking for students who are violating rules or misbehaving. We're even more primarily looking for students who are uh, behaving appropriately and following the, those expectations. We want to provide precision requests for minor infrequent behavior errors. Essentially, a precision request is a redirection where we are telling students what we would like them to do um, rather than providing threats and warnings. In fact, the research is relatively clear on the use of threats or warnings for kids with severe behavior problems. And what the research shows us is that the more negative we are with the students, the more we use threats and warnings with students with severe behavior problems, actually the more behavior issues that uh, come about as a result. So we want to try to use precision requests in the place of any threats or warnings. We also want to use preventative strategies such as pre-corrections for chronic errors, meaning that we go back and reteach students who are violating rules or expectations rather than be, uh, getting into the punishment mode, we're into the instructional mode where we're going back and doing this is a this is an opportunity to reteach what those expectations are. And finally, we want to ensure that curriculum is matched to student skill. Now why this is so important is because if we're looking at students who are exhibiting severe behavior problems, we can to some extent, it's a little overgeneralization, but to some extent we can categorize students as won't do's or can't do's. Won't do students are those students who have the capabilities, the skill levels, to complete academic work, for example, but they simply don't have the motivation to do so. So for those students that need an individualized behavior support plan, for example, and this is the steps we would take in terms of doing a functional behavioral assessment, we would first determine if there's a problem, conduct indirect assessments, descriptive assessments, and then develop some plan. Those plans typically have to do with motivating students to follow the expectations of the classroom. There's a second set of, student, set of students, though, that are considered can't do's. And these students are students who may be violating rules not because they don't have the motivation to follow the rules, but because they simply don't have the academic skills to complete the tasks that are required of them. We need to make a distinction between these two types of students. In general, a rule of thumb is won't do students tend to be more attention seeking, can't do students tend to be more escape or avoidance motivated students. Appropriate curriculum development needs to take that into consideration. 
meaning that we're going to try to decrease the level of can't-do students by providing instruction at an appropriate skill level or, or uh, academic level for those students to be successful. What schools should do? First, support students with and without disabilities in accessing general ed settings and curricula in a successful manner. It's all about access. Second, when considering comprehensive academic programming, for example, RTI or behavior programming, positive behavior supports, they should be considered together, as I've stated in the past. So when we look at curriculum development and, in general and flex literacy in specific, basically we can take a program and break it down into the components that are important with regard specifically to behavior management. Now, in flex literacy, we have four general categories that are built into the program that deal directly with behavior management issues. The first is classroom organization. Second, effective instruction. Third, self-management. And finally, social development uh, for the students. And we'll go through each one of these with examples from the program of how, how that would look. Well, let's start with classroom organization first. Classroom organization involves the use of teaching, uh, the use of te and teaching, sorry, of effective expectations and routines, and the management of transitions. Expectations specifically, when teachers use and teach effective expectations, the probability of problem behaviors occurring can be decreased. And this would be an example for, for uh, expectations. This is, these are STAR rules. So it's something that we've used in a lot of classrooms. So STAR would be sit tall or sit in a learning position, track with your finger, answer on signal, and respect others. In FLEX, we talk a great deal about developing expectations and teaching those expectations to the students. And as a matter of fact, this is uh, an example in the project experience. We prompt the teachers to go over these again with the students. So for example, I'm preparing for day one. Decide how you will organize students into project teams. And before beginning the project, review established classroom rules and procedures with students. Discuss how these will be implemented during the project experience. Again, this is a key aspect of effective behavior management where we are continuously reteaching uh, and informing students what those rules and, and routines are. In terms of routines, in classes where routines and procedures are clearly delineated, taught, reviewed, and used, appropriate behavior is much more likely to occur and the class is more likely to run smoothly. Literally, according to Archer and Hughes, predictability predicts ability. In addition to classroom routines, there's also a need for consistent and predictable instructional routines and formats. The students are better able to predict what is going to occur next when predictable instructional formats are used. So the predictability is a big part, again, in terms of behavior management for students to know what's going to come next and what's going to come after that. So in Flex Literacy, we have routines built in. This is an example of a lesson walkthrough routine. The students will get an avatar, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. They'll have a walkthrough routine, and this is the same routine that they'll be exposed to uh, on every lesson. This is an example of an instructional routine during the print experience. So we have three primary areas that we're going to be uh, addressing each week before reading objectives, during reading objectives, and after reading objectives. And again, the students will get into a routine each week um, that will help them predict what's going to happen next, what's going to happen tomorrow and the next day. There's an interesting study that was done by Nancy Cook and colleagues at the University of North Carolina, and it was comparing um, scripted versus non-scripted programs in terms of academic performance in terms of on-task performance, and then asking um, the instructors and the kids, um, which one did you like better? And what they found was that when teachers utilized scripted programs, they had higher academic performance, better on-task behavior, fewer behavior problems. Um, they had better fidelity teaching what they were supposed to teach. They liked it better. 
And the kids overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly said that they liked the predictability, they liked the um, scripted programs better. So it's an interesting um, study. There's a transition. Transitions many times are not looked at in terms of behavior management, but they very well may be one of the most important categories or areas to target in terms of behavior management. Transitions tend to increase the likelihood that students will misbehave. And according to Slavin, and this is, I believe, absolutely true, transitions are the themes of classroom management at which classroom order is most likely to come apart. The worse our, our transition management is, typically the higher levels of classroom behavior issues that we run into. Therefore, teachers should plan for transitions to try to decrease the amount of time it takes for them to occur, which means that we need to teach those routines that are aligned to those transitions. So for example, when flex literacy was being designed, we have clear transitions and times of transitions for the students. So the digital experience is at 25 minutes. If you add the print experience, it's another 25 minutes. So it's a total of 50. And then you add the project experience, it's a total of 90 minutes. The students are transitioning from the digital experience to the print experience or from the print experience to the digital experience. And then all the students transition to the project experience. Those transitions are pre-taught and expected for the students this is an example of classroom organization and transition that I was just talking about. So for the digital and print experience, half the students would be on the computer, for example. The other half would be working with the teacher, and then they switch. And then they all switch over to the project experience. But it is key, again, that those transitions are handled appropriately. The students know exactly what to do, what the expectations are, and they've been pre-taught. Effective instruction. Effective instruction increases student success and in turn decreases behavior problems. So what does effective instruction include? Scaffolded instruction, structure and organization, differentiated instruction, opportunities to respond, positive and corrective feedback, and motivational systems. And I'll talk about each one of these in turn with examples. So let's look at scaffolded instruction. Scaffolded instruction involves instructional components that move students from little to no knowledge of a skill to a demonstration of skills or knowledge at high levels. There's five components within scaffolded instruction. Explicit modeling, guided practice, independent practice, assessment of mastery, and review for maintenance. Now, I want to point out in terms of scaffolded instruction, uh, when we talk about explicit, explicit modeling, there is a misnomer out there with regard to explicit instruction versus a constructivist approach to instruction. In fact, if we look at a very effective method of instruction, which is based on a social constructivist view, which is a Vygotskyan perspective, it is perfectly aligned with an explicit uh, instructional format. So when we look at what is effective in terms of instruction, this is a scaffold instruction is quite effective. Now, these instructional components are known to affect student achievement in a positive manner, which can in turn decrease problem behaviors. So this is an example of scaffolded instruction. So with the model, this would be essentially the zone of practical development where we're modeling for the students where they are capable with help of achieving the skill. This is an I do. We go into the guide, which is a we do. Then from there, they move into monitor, independent practice, then a mastery check, and then review, which is maintenance. This is an example of how this is done. So in the model, for example, this is on the digital experience. We provide a teaching tip, for example. Remember, if a noun is a singular thing, it's a singular noun. If a noun is more than one thing, it is a plural noun. And then the computer will go through, walk the students through how to uh, show what are singular and plural nouns. In the guide, we'll continuously uh, show, do a model, and then the students will gradually increase the amount of responses and responsibility they, they have uh, with regard to showing the skill, demonstrating the skill, and then finally monitor the students are totally independent uh, where they're performing the skill on their own. 
And then finally, after they achieve mastery at that point, then they move into an assessment. There's a structure and organization. We know that there, there is a lack of structure or, or organization in instruction. Students are, are more likely to misbehave. Structure and organization can occur in the following ways. Lessons are planned for each day or across several days. Lessons are, lessons are scripted with an easy to follow daily plan of instruction. Lessons are systematic in nature, so a logical order to the instructional task keeps errors to a minimum. And this is an example of what's built into Flex. So we've got a program calendar, for example, where we can plan out several weeks in advance of exactly what's going to happen. Uh, and those can be flexible where we can modify uh, this, this uh, uh, calendar. But it's important that we know exactly what's going to be going on from a day-to-day, week-to-week basis. This is a structure and organization of the three learning experiences. So these have been integrated together. Um, so in the digital experience, the students, again, go through the model guide monitor. If the students are struggling in the monitor phase, then they move into individualized instruction, and then they go back to modeling. The print experience, they have a model guide monitor, and then at the end of that, a critical thinking application, and then we have the project experience where they extend many of the skills that they've learned in projects. This is an example of a scripted lesson, and Nancy covered that in the uh, a study that she talked about, the importance of a scripted lesson in the print experience. In terms of differentiated instruction, differentiated instruction allows teachers to meet the needs of all students moving from more teacher-directed instruction when students are naive learners to more student-centered instruction when students have the skills to do it on their own. Again, that again fits back into that social constructivist and explicit instructional uh, framework. Multi-sensory instruction relates to instruction that incorporates all three learning senses, sensory modes, auditory, visual, tactile, kinesthetic, into each instructional session. And again, this is an important component of effective instruction where we're looking not at a particular sensory mode, but we're covering all of the different sensory modes for the students for better learning process. Matching instruction to student learning needs involves determining the appropriate placement level and instructional intensity required based on student skill levels. If instruction is not matched to student skill levels, problem behaviors may result. So placement tests need to be used. If we use placement tests, we're able to determine whether or not students, if their misbehaviors are due to escape or avoidance, and that's what we talked about before. So if we're meeting the instructional needs of the students and we still see behavior issues, we may then start thinking about this as a motivational rather than an instructional uh, issue. This is an example of the multi-sensory mode of instruction. So we've got kids at the computers on the left side. They switch over to teacher-directed, uh, teacher-led instruction, shared reading opportunities, for example, in the print experience. And then the students transition into the project experience where there's a lot of hands-on learning and group-based uh, partnership types of learning opportunities. In terms of meeting the needs for individual students, there are 11 entry play, uh, placement points for students based on their reading levels, going from beginning reading up to over 1,000 uh, uh, lexile uh, points. So we're trying to meet the needs for a wide range of students as much as we possibly can. In terms of data management, there's a great deal of data management or data collection in the program that's collected primarily through the computer systems through FlexWorks. So we know how the students are progressing at all times. And if they're beginning to struggle, we'll be notified of that pretty quickly. Data management system allows us to do adaptive remediation. So for example, if students are in the monitor phase, meaning that they're at independence, if they have two consecutive lessons at less than 80% proficiency, they move into an online remediation that's done by the computer. If they continue two more times at less than 80%, the teacher is alerted and the student gets an individualized remediation from the teacher. That occurs during, partially during that uh, print experience. 
This is an example of uh, skill differentiation. So, it, for example, with individualized instruction, we refer to FlexWorks to provide additional instruction based on students' progress in the digital experience. And then independent reading opportunities are matched to the students' Lexile measures or skill levels. In terms of acceleration, there are those students who will need to be accelerated, and that also occurs to meet the needs of uh, individual students. So there's an adaptive acceleration. If the students hit 100% of mastery, three consecutive lessons, then they skip the remaining lessons and move on. So they can accelerate through the program uh, when they don't need the extra repetition. Opportunities to respond is a very important area now, and you see that quite a bit in the research literature. There's a lot of talk about the need for opportunities to respond, getting the reps up as much as we can with the students. So results from intervention research show that increasing opportunities for students to respond correctly to academic questions, tasks, and demands also positively affect students' appropriate academic and social behaviors, meaning the more that they're engaged, the less behavior problems that we typically see. Success promotes success when students respond correctly and frequently they learn more and misbehave less. So successful engagement, engagement is predicted on appropriate student placement. So in FLEX, there is, if students are taking too long during the digital experience, for example, the students are prompted uh, to move along. So, for example, we have here, are you still there? Your lesson will time out in 14 seconds. Move your mouse or press any key to cancel this countdown. We're trying to get the students to move through the lessons as rapidly as we can. So the message uh, students receive, uh, you'll see, and then, it's, then we calculated the opportunities to respond during the digital experience, and we're between 0.72 per minute to 3.96, depending upon the type of skill. So if students have a passage to read, for example, the OTRs will drop because it takes more time to read the passage. But we are uh, concerned about making sure the students have enough opportunities to respond during a lesson to be successful. Positive and corrective feedback, effective positive and corrective feedback is a critical aspect of effective instruction. Out such feedback, students who commit errors will continue to practice those errors. Error corrections, then, are really, really critical. So we try to use error corrections that avoid negativity. For example, phrases such as, no, that's incorrect, you're guessing, you can do better than that, you're not trying hard enough, that you will not see that in the program. If immediate feedback, you see this chart when it occurs during guide, monitor, and review. And it is immediate. That's one of the advantages of the digital experience. It's instantaneous. In writing the program, we also set up rules for providing corrective feedback. Again, you won't see any negativity in this. So if the students are correct, for example, in the guide, good job, you did the skill correctly. If they miss or they make a mistake, we'll have a prompt. Remember the teaching tip. We'll go back through the teaching tip as a re-learning opportunity. Then we'll prompt the student, look at the answer and try again. If the student is still incorrect, then we provide the correct answer for the student. In the monitor and review, it's similar, except on the first attempt, we have them retry. On the second attempt, we go back through again, reteaching the teaching tip. And then the, on the third try, we provide the correct answer. So again, it's important to point out that there's no negativity here. An error is an opportunity to reteach the skill to the student. Okay, in terms of motivational systems, of course, that's critical, especially for secondary level students. Students are more likely to, to be engaged and on task when the lesson is presented at a lively pace in which the lesson moves smoothly and quickly from input to response to feedback and back again. Praise has been cited as an effective strategy for promoting school achievement and positive classroom behavior. The importance of praise cannot be overstated then. And point systems have also been noted as effective motivators for students. You'll see all of these different motivational systems built within the program. So for example, in terms of a motivated, motivational animated video, before each skill, each new skill is presented, the students will watch a short motivational animated video. For example, with uh, this one that's up here. Um, 
So that's motivational. They're funny. They're, they're engaging for the students. But they also lead to a point in terms of the instruction, what we're trying to cover for the students. During the digital and print experiences, we also have themes. And those are themes that are motivational to the students. So for example, uh, extreme sports, for, for instance, uh, Cartoon World, the movie studio. Um, we try to make sure that the themes are engaging for the students. This is an example of praise. So lots of praise in the program. So if the students make a correct response, for example, here with boat, the avatar says, well done, boat is a singular noun. It is the correct answer. It's the correct answer. Students get a room to decorate. So as they're moving through the program, they can rack up points. And when they rack up points, they'll have a few minutes in their room during a lesson where they can use those points in exchange for uh, items to decorate the rooms. And these are just some examples of different rooms. This is an example of an item shop that students get access to where they can, can uh, trade those points in for items to put into the, those rooms. This is an example of an avatar. Every student will get an avatar that they'll walk through the uh, lesson. That's where we had the um, routines, for example. I talked about that. So the students are able to customize their avatars. They can be humans or they can be monsters, uh, but they can totally customize their avatars to however they want them to look. It's very much personalized. There's also games within the program. These are educational games. So for example, here is a game, try to, uh, to correctly spell the plural form of penny. This is an example. I've watched the kids with these games, too. The kids really like these. Uh, they're a lot of fun to the students. So here we have a racing game. So using your mouse control the racing track, change lanes, drive over speed boosts, and avoid oil slicks. When your truck goes over a jump, you'll be asked a question. A correct answer will speed you up, and an incorrect choice will slow you down. A lot of motivational activity is built within the program that's critical for any program. In terms of self-management, I personally consider self-management to be one of the more effective behavior management methods used today for a variety of students. Perhaps the most important self-management skill for students to learn is self-evaluation. Self-evaluation involves teaching students to measure their own behavior against some specified standard. So this is an example of a self-evaluation form and a reading log found in the interactive reader and the print experience. And if you notice the self-evaluation form on the left side, students are able to evaluate how they're meeting those expectations. So for example, I spoke clearly when it was my turn to read my lines. I worked well with my class to practice my lines. I listened to others so that we spoke together on group lines. I highlighted my lines so I knew when to speak. I held the script so people could hear me. I used my voice to help people understand the poem. And again, it's important for the students to learn these self-evaluation skills. On the right side, you see the reading log where the students are able to keep track of the start date, end date, the title of the book they read, the author, and how they would rate this book and why. This is an example of assessment guides during the project experience. So for example, on the far left, the collaborative, a collaboration assessment guide. How did, it, how did I collaborate with the student, with other students? Did I respect? to you know, show respect for people and ideas that's near the bottom there. So I should respect from one, one another's idea. Ideas uh, made sure that all the team members' opinions were heard. And also we have conflict resolution built in. Followed discussion rules to resolve conflicts, remove conflicts with respect, or resolve conflicts with respect for all involved. Um, we have the presentation assessment guide speaking skills, listening skills, use of technology, appropriate facts and details, and so on, informative writing assessment guide, and a writing checklist. So there's a lot of self-evaluation that's built into this program, which I think is key. In terms of social development, that is a key area now. There's a lot of talk going on in terms of needing to teach students how to interact with one another appropriately, the need for uh, collaborative project teams, working in a team to getting something done to problem solve, that's built in. 
So students must develop social behaviors to have meaningful relationships with their peers, teachers, and parents. Social competence is considered a critical skill in today's world. Social behaviors that are important to school success often include individual responsibilities, for example, social etiquette, project contribution, team responsibilities, so for example, collaborating with team members, resolving conflicts with respect for all involved. This is an example of an information sheet and action plan for team projects during the project experience. So you see on the left the project information sheet, what the expectations are for the team to work together to solve those or to, to uh, meet those expectations. And on the right side, the project action plan. Who are the team members? What are they going to be doing? We have a checklist for the, each individual and also for the project team. So again, trying to build those social relationships and working together uh, and resolve any problems and conflicts is key to behavior management. All right, that's, that's it in terms of the presentation. Uh, just a quick uh, overview. You have a link to the white paper this was based on, and there's a lot more examples in there, and it expands upon these, uh, these um, topics. Okay, and now we can take questions if you have them. Thanks, Ron and Nancy. We actually do have a couple questions that have come in. Um, the first question that we received was, what are precision requests? Good question. A precision request, I also call them uh, startup requests. But precision requests were, um, what is a term that is used um, by a researcher, well-known researcher in the area of behavior management by the name of Ron Nelson. And precision requests are essentially um, a redirect. So, for example, if a student is off task, instead of saying, if you don't get on task, you're going to have to go to timeout, a precision request, request would be, I need you to get on task. And if the student doesn't, then there's, there'll be a prearranged uh, consequence. But what's key to precision requests, I think, is that it turns behavior management issues into a compliance issue rather than a, a, the behavior in and of itself. So for example, if I say, if you don't get on task, then I'm going to have to send you to timeout, and the student doesn't get on task, and I'm sending the kid for being off task. On the other hand, with the precision request, if I say you need to get on task, if the kid doesn't get on task, then the student may suffer a consequence for not following my directions. Um, the, the, the reason why precision requests, again, are so important is because you want to try to reduce as much as possible the amount of coercive types of control, which would be threats and warnings, for example. It works for, threats and warnings work for a majority of our kids, but again, the data are relatively clear when we're working with kids with more severe behavior issues. Therefore, when I'm training teachers and talking to teachers, I try to get them to not use threats or warnings to control student behavior. I'd rather than use a redirect or a precision request. Yeah, and I, I just saw that in, in a classroom this morning where the teacher had the star rules and sit in the learning position. So there was a student who was out of his seat and she walked over to him and said, I need for you to sit in the learning position. It's a precision request. And then once he sat back down, then she made sure to catch him being good. And she went over and said, thank you for sitting in the learning position. OK, we have another question that says, what happens if students are not ready to transit on activities? For transitioning? So for example, like uh, on the, we saw that actually uh, in one of the implementations where the student uh, we're working on the computer, and um, the teacher was running the group in the print experience. And it, I think a, a good rule of thumb might be to alert the students that there's five minutes left as a sort of an idea to let them know that the session is going to be ending soon, one minute left. Now it's time to, to um, transition to the next um, center or ne next experience. That's nice because it just alerts students that the time is going to be coming down to an end. Seems to work well. The, the other thing that we've noticed in, in the sites that we've been in to watch um, 
the students engaged is with flex literacy in particular is that we want to make sure that each of the different uh, learning opportunities, their experiences are, are highly motivating. So we haven't seen, and, and we're in classrooms, by the way, with kids with ha who have uh, behavior issues. Uh, some classes that are uh, special ed, um, DD classrooms. And the students uh, generally are motivated during the print experience. There's a lot of cool, fun activities that are going on, and they're quite engaged. But then when they're able to transition to the computer, there's also a lot of neat things going on during the computer. So we haven't seen um, issues with students not wanting to transition. Uh, the other thing is, with the time, uh, 25 minutes, um, the students are transitioning at a point before they start getting really bored with the task, too. So there's a fairly f frequent uh, movement um, that increases the motivation for the students. But I mean, the reality is there will be students who will have issues with transitioning, and then that, that behavior issue needs to be addressed specifically for that student. But in good instructional design, we try to make sure that transition from one experience to the next uh, isn't an issue, because what's going to be coming next is just as fun as what we're doing right now. And, and also, once you, you, know, you provide the five minutes three minutes, one minute, as an example, or five minutes, one minute, and then you tell the students it's time to trans transition. When they do transition the right way, it's making sure the teacher catches the kids being good. I really like the way you guys transitioned. That was really quick. There's praise also for following um, the expectations for the transition as well. Yeah, you know, and that's a good point in, in terms of um, what we see a lot. If, if we can, and, and there's different guidelines. I mean, uh, Randy Sprick, for example, Safe in Civil Schools, or Rob Horner with the School Wide Positive Behavior Supports, we're, we vary a little bit in terms of what we, we uh, would like to see. I go with a 5 to 1 rule. Others may go with a 3 to 1 rule or 4 to 1 rule. The point really isn't whether it's 5 or 3 or 4. The point is that we want to be as positive as you can. So if we do catch kids who are transitioning appropriately, we want to make sure that we acknowledge that transition um, uh, rather than trying to catch the kids who aren't transitioning. And it does make a major difference when we're working with kids uh, who have motivational issues. Okay, thank you. We do have some additional questions. Um, this question is referencing, uh, looks like slide number 51 that showed examples of games students can earn to play during the digital experience. And the comment was, um, said, try to spell the plural form of penny. And they said that they would prefer that we don't use the word try because it implies that they're not sure that the student could be successful or that the possibility is 50-50. What are your thoughts on that? With the word try to correctly spell? Um, I don't know. I mean, it, I'm just in terms of this particular game, I mean, there's points for simply being in the game and then increased points for participating in the format. So it's not as though they wouldn't get anything. If I'm, if I'm understanding the, the question, it wouldn't be where they wouldn't get anything at all for being a part of a game. Yeah, the way I would view this is I would absolutely agree with that if this was a skill that what the student was still acquiring. Yeah. Um, however, this isn't. This is a skill the, kid has, the student has already uh, acquired. Therefore, it's more of a uh, challenge to the student mm -hmm. in a game format than an instructional component. This, right. this yeah. is something that's fun for the students to do. Right. So I'd look at that more as a challenge uh, to the student. But I would absolutely agree with you if this was in the beginning acquisition uh -huh. stage uh -huh. for the student where the students are going to make mistakes. By the time we get to this point, we shouldn't be seeing mistakes. Yeah. Then we had a question. Um, they wanted to know if SRA Flex Literacy is geared to certain grade levels. Yeah, it, the, the program's targeted for um, the elementary experience is um, targeted for um, students uh, typically in grades 3 to 5, and the secondary experience is for grades 6 on up. And I might add that that's, that's also geared toward Tier 2, 3, or 4. Correct. Yeah, that's correct. You're right. Sure. And there's a heavy emphasis. Oh, I'm sorry. There's a heavy emphasis. The Common Core State Standards, as we now you know, know of course, the, the big push is to get kids um, 
you know, instruction should be aligned to the Common Core now. And so the, this program meets, you know, 85, 90 percent of the Common Core state standards in English language arts. Whether you're looking at, if you look at it in, as a full three experience, um, program, digital, print, and project, and you're meeting, um, you know, most every Common Core state standard in English language arts, which is nice. It's not just reading, but focusing on speaking and listening and language and writing. Yeah, as a matter of fact, when we start, when this program was being developed, this was before Common Core state standards came out, and we had a number of lessons developed, and when Common Core came out, we went back and Built, we started built rewriting yeah. the entire program yeah. uh, to make sure that we're addressing those higher level skills that the Common Core is expecting. Right. And just to tag on that, we did have a question that said, please talk briefly about the connection between SRA Flex Literacy and the Common Core State Standards, particularly when you're working with more than one grade level in, in the same classroom. Yeah, and you know what, it's a great question. And what we're really mindful of is that at various grades, when we're working with students who struggle, we have to take, um, for example, text evidence as a, one particular example. You take the grade level standard, but you've got to unpack it and teach the prerequisite skills so that students can be uh, successful in more um, complex kinds of um, standards. And you know, we're really um, promoting text complexity, which is all the talk now. We've got to start ramping kids up with their exposure to higher and higher levels of text and getting kids in to do a close read. And, and when students are in the text and really grappling with tougher concepts and tougher discussion, and that's what the print experience does. So yeah, we're mindful of the, the text complexity issues. We're mindful of the fact that um, there are grade level standards, but that we do need to unpack them to ensure that the prerequisites are met so that they can do these higher level kinds of activities. And, and during the print experience, the, I think what's, what's important is we, we're, we're obviously going to have students at different levels, uh, right. different skill levels. But even if a student is at a lower reading level than students in the same group, they're still able to participate mm -hmm in the reading activity at the grade level, the grade level reading activities. Mm -hmm. So one nice feature of the database, uh, database on, on Flex is it will uh, notify teachers of which students for that particular reading passage, for that particular day in the print experience, which students are able to handle that level of complex text. As far as the read aloud goes. Yeah. So they, when there's a read aloud, then they can jump in and, and participate as well. The teacher could call on those students to read. But it is based on a read aloud because we want to make sure that the students have exposure to rich text that's ramped up in terms of uh, vocabulary. Okay, we have two more questions. Hopefully we can get to. Um, the first of those is, what do you do when the student becomes physically disruptive and unable to self-regulate their own emotions? If, uh, well, the reason I'm hesitating with that is the, the association, let me, let me go back to what, yeah. what I always tell people uh, when I'm presenting. The, the Association for Behavior Analysis has a position statement on any consultant who will give, give um, uh, suggestions without ever actually knowing the student or seeing the student uh, is probably someone you don't want to trust. <laughs> so that being the case. Uh, I'll give you a suggestion. Um, when we're working with, when I, what I found over 20 plus years working with students who are highly volatile is one is to try to go against what our normal inclination is, which would be to come down harder on the kid. For example, zero tolerance policies and so on, expulsions, uh, suspensions, which tend not to work for those very students. And I refer you to the work of uh, Russ Skiba uh, with regard to that um, and the, how ineffectual the, those approaches are. But we want to become more positive with the students as much as we can, which, again, is difficult in some ways because it's against our normal inclination when a student is misbehaving to become more positive with the students. Second thing is it's an indication that the student needs to learn 
certain skills. So for example, one of the things that we would do is to try to determine what the reason or the function of the behavior is, and then teach the student explicitly a skill to access that same motivator or the same reinforcer with a more appropriate social behavior. Now, uh, briefly, and it's more complex than this, there's more steps, but briefly what you would do is this. For example, let's say I give a student uh, an academic task to do, and I get this, the student uh, flies off the handle, becomes very aggressive, very destructive, um, and I determine that that student is engaging in that behavior in order to escape or avoid the work for whatever reason. Um, what I, one step I could take is to teach the student explicitly how to engage in appropriate social behavior. So for example, asking for a break or asking to get out of the work appropriately and then allowing the student to do so. Uh, now many people may, out there may go, well that doesn't make any sense because you're allowing the kid to escape. That's not the only, that, that's not the stopping point. But we need to first get the behavior under control and then we start moving toward where we want the student to be. The last thing is, is I found that self-management procedures, again, self-monitoring works extremely well with kids who need that type of feedback and more, more uh, self-motivated types of control procedures. And there's a whole research base on teaching self-management procedures to students just like what you're talking about. Okay, we, we had a few more questions, but we have run out of time. And in the interest of uh, everyone's time being so valuable, we will respond to those additional questions via email as specified at the beginning of today's call. Also, wanted to share with you in the chat box a digital sampler. And you should uh, see that in green on your chat box at this moment. So feel free to explore SRA Flex Literacy further using this digital sampler as we conclude today. And again, we do appreciate the time that Ron and Nancy have dedicated to presenting today's session. And we appreciate the time for all of you that have taken time to participate. Again, we will be sending out a follow-up email with a recording of today's session that you can share with your colleagues, along with a white paper and the link to the digital sampler as well. So with that, um, on behalf of McGraw-Hill School Education and Specialized Solutions Group, uh, thanks again, and I wish everyone a great afternoon and evening. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.